Hey, it's Mike Hambright back with another Flip Nerd VIP show. Today, I'm joined by John Anderson, who's the founder and CEO of Oyez, which is a brokerage that focuses on uh, short sales in the North Texas region. But he's got great information about short sales in the short sale industry and uh, that affects, uh, impacts people nationwide. And of course, we're going to learn more about his story and how he built his successful business. Before we get started, let's take a second to recognize our featured sponsors. RealtyMogul.com is an online marketplace for real estate investing, connecting borrowers and capital from accredited and institutional investors. Get a rehab loan fast and close in as little as 10 days. Rates start as low as 9%. We'd also like to thank National Real Estate Insurance Group, the nation's leading provider of insurance to the residential real estate investor market. From individual properties to large-scale investors, National Real Estate Insurance Group is ready to serve you. Please note, the views and opinions expressed by the individuals in this program do not necessarily reflect those of FlipNerd.com or any of its partners, advertisers, or affiliates. Please consult professionals before making any investment or tax decisions, as real estate investing can be risky. Hey, John. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me. Good. Good. Glad you're here. So tell us a little bit about, before, before we introduce uh, you and learn a little bit more about you, Tell me how you came up with the name of your company. Um, interesting story. It, when uh, me and my partner, who was Eartha Wang, started the getting into real estate, we initially started as investors. We were buying properties and repairing them and selling them, basically. Um, like a lot, that's how I think a lot of people get into this business. And <clears throat> it started to grow and we had an, a, a friend that was an attorney and he had said, you really should incorporate to protect your personal assets. And we went, okay, well, let's do it. And got out the paperwork to do, file for corporation and, you know, in there it's like company name and we had never even thought about a company name before. Um, so it became a quick exercise. Well, let's come up with a name and Eartha literally opened a dictionary and pointed to the first word she saw, which was um, oi, which is spelled O-Y-E-Z, um, which is what a bailiff says when court starts. Oi, 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 all rise, Judge Judy's coming in. And she also had read a book about Google and how the word Google is actually misspelled. Um, they had added an extra O to it, so she basically copied them and added a Z to the oi, and we changed the pronunciation to oi, oyes, which kind of sounded like, oh, yes, and five-minute exercise, and that's the company name. And, it, and it's worked out well because it's different and unusual. You know, it could have been Anderson and Wang Real Estate, but right. you know, it's not noticeable. The OEAs, we, we get asked a lot about the name, so it makes us recognizable. Yeah, yeah, great. Okay. Well, tell us a little bit about your uh, background before you got in the uh, short sale business, about how you kind of came about and maybe how you identified an opportunity that obviously today it, it is a big deal, uh, certainly in some parts of the country. But tell us a little bit about kind of your journey about how you got from, I know you had a corporate background and then got into uh, real estate investing yourself and then obviously found your way into the short sale business. Yeah, um, both Earth and I came out of the telephone industry. Um, she's an electrical engineer, I have a computer science background. And I had worked in the telephone industry for 25 years, became an executive there. And then when the telecom industry imploded and I got sent on my way, it be, I thought it'd be great to get into real estate. I had some real estate background in uh, different cities, buying houses and repairing them and living in them and selling them. So I figured, I figured I'd do it full time. Um, so we got into it, like I said, Earth and I just initially just buying houses and investing in them. But what we soon found was it was hard to find good deals. So we were looking for ways to buy houses cheaper and we came across this concept of short sales. Now this is before the collapse of the housing market in mm -hmm. 2008. And so we learned what short sales were, how they worked, and we started looking for distressed houses that were upside down in value simply because they were physically distressed. The, right. the homeowners had abused the house. And so what and, year would this have been when you started doing this? 2007. 2007, okay. Yeah, the, the calm, so 2006, the calm before the storm. 2007. It was the calm before the storm. Yeah, and it was working. I, I can't say we did a lot of them, but you know we were getting two or three a year that we were 
getting houses sold short to us and we were buying them ourselves and back then uh, the process was really difficult and but it was also easier to get the banks to accept a huge discount back then um, I don't think they were very wise as far as looking at the value of the houses so it was working and then like you said in June 2008 when the economy tanked and the housing market collapsed um, all of a sudden like one out of four houses were upside down in value and we were like wow we're in the right place right time with the right processes so we started doing them for consumers not just to buy them and uh, collecting the commission from the, the lenders to get the house sold short and change the whole business model and that's how we got into this business and now we do i'd say right now we probably got about 120 in progress Okay. At any given point in time, so it's we can do quite a quite a volume now, and it the market bears that fairly well. Okay, we have a lot of savvy uh, real estate investors that watch the show, but just for those that that maybe don't understand what a short sale is, why don't you talk a little bit about kind of what that even means? Okay, what well, basically what a short sale is? It's where the, a house is sold for less than what's owed on the mortgage. So let's say you have a mortgage of a hundred thousand that's due. But the house sells for eighty thousand because of the the market itself says the the neighborhood's only worth eighty thousand, or the house is physically distressed and the value is fallen to eighty thousand. Um, basically, we get the house sold for eighty or less than eighty because banks still will accept a discount on some houses um, if they're sold short. So we get it sold for let's say seventy thousand, um, and that seventy thousand pays off the mortgage completely. The homeowner walks away free and clear. They don't owe the difference. Um, and the buyer gets the house free and clear. And okay. No encumbrances. It's, and um, the, seller, the seller avoids <laughs> seller avoids foreclosure and the bank avoids the, all the expense of having to go through a foreclosure. Is that, that's the primary uh, motivation for those two parties, right? Exactly. The the seller is, and, and in addition, the seller also has the opportunity to get some cash because the, the bank is trying to avoid the foreclosure enough to the point where they'll sell it at a discount and give not a lot, but some cash to the seller to incent them to do the short sale. And it's still, the bank still comes out ahead because if they go through the foreclosure process, they're going to have to pay an attorney. They're going to, and their processors are so slow. They end up sitting on a house for months, maybe a year. So they're paying all the taxes, the right. HOA fees. And then in many cases, they end up having to evict the homeowner because they won't leave. So the, the costs just keep climbing. So right. the short sale is a clean cut and it's worth it to them to uh, pay us in a commission and pay the homeowner an incentive to, to move out with a clean house. Okay. So talk about this kind of phenomenon that started to occur in 08, 09, 2010, where all of a sudden every real estate agent in the world is a short sale expert. Yeah. Yeah. Well, like I said, I don't know the statistics anymore, but back then um, in 08, it was one out of four houses were upside down in value. Hmm. Um, so that 25% of the market had to be sold short if it was going to be sold. And when you have that big of a piece of the pie being um, short, every agent out there took a class and said they're a short sale expert or they're short sale certified. And so everybody was claiming they could do it. Um, but short sales are not very easy. And if um, you're used to the traditional real estate sale, short sales can be confusing and in most cases they fail. Um, matter of fact, here, here's a statistic that does hold true that only 20% of short sales actually close. Um, the 80% that don't close usually go into foreclosure or um, they try a different agent to do the short sale. So it's it's not a very successful um, transaction in most cases. Um, luckily, ours is not down there. We, our transactions are pretty high. Our closes are pretty high. We're up in the 90% range. But that's mainly because that's all we do. So we, we've and we do a large volume, so we got a lot of um, knowledge about how to get through the bank's um, maze of processes and, you know, the difficulties that they have. Yeah. So that close rate is is phenomenal. Um, talk a little bit about what, what that means, because it seems to me you'd have a high percentage of people that, um, you know, as a real estate investor myself, I know there's a lot of folks that when they start to realize that they are 
in some sort of financial trouble, sometimes they throw up their hands or they've mentally convinced themselves that I don't care what happens to my credit or if I'm not going to get much, then I might as well just walk away from it. Or the, some of the motivation I know is, is to get that seller engaged to get the information they need to the lender because the lender requires them to provide certain things like a hardship letter, copies of their financials and tax returns. And talk a little bit about how you've overcome that uh, where a lot of other agents maybe haven't. Um, <clears throat> you, you hit something that's really important there about you know the seller. Um, in most cases, these sellers have mentally checked out um, because they're, let me, I'm going to deviate a little bit on here. There's two criteria that they have to meet in order to qualify for a short sale. One is they have to have the house upside down, which we talked about. And the other thing is they have to have a financial difficulty. If, if they're flush with cash or they've got a six-figure job and they just want to get rid of their house, they're not going to qualify. So to qualify, basically, there's a handful of reasons. One, divorce, loss of job, loss of income, um, medical problems like, you know, severe, can't work because you've had a heart attack um, or forced relocation. And in those scenarios, those are usually bad things. So if somebody lost their job and then what we also see in many cases, they lose their job, then they end up getting divorced because of the stress of the situation. Right. Now they're losing their house. So these people are not happy campers. You know, bad things have happened to them. Now they're losing their house. They really don't care um, in many cases. So it's really difficult to get the necessary information and stuff out of them. So what we've learned to do with these is basically do it ourselves. We don't rely on the person to do it. So the hardship letter we'll sit, we go to them, go to their house and we'll sit down with them and talk to them about what the situation is. And then in some cases we'll write it for them and have them sign it mm -hmm. just to make it easy on them. The, the other things is throughout the short sale process, you have to collect financial information, which is basically pay stubs and um, checking account statements. And you have right. to get it every month from them. Um, so that, is a challenge because a lot of times these folks, like I said earlier, checked out and they're like, I, I don't want to go to the bank. I've done enough of this. Right. So again, it requires handholding. In some cases, we'll ask them, call your bank and give the bank permission for us to go pick up a copy of your checking account statement. And we'll drive to the bank and pick it up for them. Right. Um, pay stubs, you know, we've had cases where we've gone to their employer and said, you know, get permission from them first. But pick up a copy of their pay stub for them mm. just to keep the process moving. Um, so it, it's a lot of busy work running around and we end up having to have a courier pick up a lot of this stuff, but it keeps the deals alive. Right, right. Well, can you talk I'll throw one more. Yeah, go ahead. I, I was throw one more thing. Another thing that we've learned is we get everything we can up front at the initial meeting so that we're not coming back and asking them for anything. Um, I've seen some agents who say they're short sale specialists basically give a package to the consumer and say, here, fill it out, send it in, let me know when the bank says they got it. And, you know, if it's a stack of 40 pages, they put it in a drawer and say, I'll get to it later and then never get to it. So, right, right. Okay. And talk a little bit about um, what you feel has happened over the last several years in terms of uh, banks being a little more, a little bit easier to work with. Because I know that some are harder to work with than others. And I know in the past, just generally speaking, um, things from what I've heard seem to be easier now because they have processes in place and things like that than, than they did in years past. Can you talk a little bit about the trend of what's happened there? Yeah, there's um, some things that have gotten better and some things that have gotten, I'm not gonna say worse, but not good for the investor community with the banks um, becoming better at dealing with short sales. Um, when we first started doing short sales back in the 2006 and seven area, um, some of the bank, I'm not kidding, some banks we'd call and say we want to do a short sale and they'd say, what's a short sale? Right. And uh, a couple of small banks in Fort Worth, we literally went to them and showed them what a short sale is and they agreed to do them. Hmm. Uh, but this, that's a long time ago. Um, since the housing market um, collapse, most banks now know what a short sale is and what's changed is is that they've really beefed up the departments that process short sales and once they do that they've also improved their processes and the other thing 
many of the big banks have done is improved the ability to communicate with them. Um, basically, there's a system out there called Equator that um, as a brokerage, we put information in Equator, the bank sees it in there, and the bank puts their information in Equator, and we see it. So it's we, we got away from that. I faxed you this document, and I'm saying, well, I never received it. Um, <laughs> some right. funny stories. We There's some banks, we literally faxed 40-page documents to them 20 or 30 times. We would wow. just send it over and over and over and over because they kept saying they didn't receive it. And we were, our approach was, well, if you're going to say you didn't receive it, I'm going to give it to you 30 times. Right. Um, but that, those days are gone with the new systems and the banks having their, um, processes improved. Now the, the downside of this is, is that the banks have gotten much smarter about the values of houses in a short sale. Um, early on, a lot of times they just took our word for it on what the value was. Mm -hmm. um, now they do their due diligence and they know the value. So the days of being able to get a house for 50 cents on the dollar in a short sale are long gone. Mm. Um, they, they do, the banks do sell them at a discount, but it's not those huge discounts. So that's the one downside, but, um, with volume, it kind of makes it up. Right, right. So talk a little bit about, uh, the business side of, uh, of your business. So, at some point, you were working short sales for yourself, and then you decided to turn that into essentially a service provider and a brokerage to work with other investors and uh, other folks that may bring deals to you. So talk about your kind of decision to make that a service for others. Um, when we initially started, like you said, we were buying the short sales ourselves, right. um, and a couple of things happened. One it became more difficult for us to buy them ourselves because the, the banks could see the conflict of interest in there that if we were the broker re representing the seller and the buyer, um, they a lot of times would say, we, we, won't, we won't do that. Mm -hmm. we, we'll let you be the broker and the, and the selling agent, but you can't be the buyer. Um, so that was one piece that made us decide, well, if we want to do this, we need to move it more towards a service than a investment type scenario. Um, the second thing is, is we saw the volume and we thought with enough volume, we could, even though the commissions are not very big compared to what you can make when you purchase and um, sell a house, especially on the retail side. But if we did enough of these, we could um, do a lot more and make up for the, the loss on the investment side. So that was the business decision was to do volume and make it a service. And we also saw at that point in time that it was a, a void in the market, that there was a lot of people out there that, that wanted to do a short sale, but agents didn't know how to do it or refused to do it. And we thought, well, if we jump on this early, we can get in there ahead of the curve and um, grab a bigger, pair, piece or, a bigger piece of the pie. Right, right. So how much of your business now is from um – referrals or, you know, whether it's investors or other agents bringing you deals to work versus, I guess, maybe things you're, you're finding organically yourself. Um, <clears throat> stuff we find organically ourselves, which would be, you know, our web page, um, we yellow pages, um, some print advertising is probably only makes up about 30% of our business now. Okay. The other 70% is all referral from investors and from real estate agents. And, and the motivation for those two are different. Um, real estate agents, we basically um, do a, we cut the commission, they get a percent, we get a percent. Um, on the investor side, basically what we offer is, is that um, if they, send an offer in with it, they become the first in line, which, you know, we can talk about the process with short sales in a minute, but it allows them to be first and they have the first opportunity to buy the house. So if they find it through their own advertising, but it's upside down and they want to purchase it through a short sale, we can get them first in line so that they are first to buy it. And then if it doesn't work, then um, we'll, we'll pay them a finder's fee. Okay. Okay. And, and talk a little bit about, are you primarily uh, serving the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area, the North Texas area, or, or do, you, do you work deals all over the country? Um, we, good question. Um, our main area is Dallas-Fort Worth and Houston. Okay. Um, those are the two cities that we have the most volume. Um, we are currently looking at expanding into San Antonio and Austin, which hopefully this year will be there. Um, the, however, we 
can do them anywhere in the country. Yeah. And, and we have. We've done them in West Virginia, Louisiana, a bunch in California. Um, and basically in those scenarios, though, all we do is the negotiations with the lenders. Um, an agent that has a license in, let's say, California, if the house is in California, has to represent the seller um, as a real estate agent. Um, and then what we end up doing is, again, splitting the commission between the agent that's representing the seller and us that's doing the negotiation with the lender. Right. So, so we, you, you we really need to have, I guess, boots on the ground to gather information from the sellers and stuff, which is harder to do centrally, I guess. Yeah. Well, actually, even in that scenario, what we do is we still um, gather the information from the seller. We have mm -hmm. to do it remotely, either through mail or fax. We don't rely on the on the agent in the state to do it because, again, it's it, it decreases the likelihood that it's going to close. But what we do do with that age, what we do use that agent for is um, they do the listing in their local MLS system um, and they they also do like the, the pictures because obviously we can't take pictures of the house from right. Texas. Right. Um, so they just do kind of the basic stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And is that is that seem to be a, an opportunity for you to partner with uh, because uh, I guess I was going to say to partner with out of state agents or sources and do you feel like uh, uh, that your your negotiating side is kind of the crown jewel of of uh, your business. Absolutely, that that's <clears throat> that's what we really focused on was our processes and the negotiators themselves. There's a there's a team of four negotiators out there. I don't know if you can hear them talking behind me, mm -hmm. um, but that th those are the folks that make it happen because um, they're they're on the phone they know how to deal with the lenders they know the ins and outs of each lender because they that's all they do eight hours a day five days a week and that's what makes us successful is understanding how to get that lender to agree to a short payoff and uh, not have them play bureaucracy with us and say you know oh I'm missing this document or you know I can't find your file we, we've learn how to get around that stuff so that okay. the way you put it i've never used that term before crown jewel but that is our secret sauce yeah yeah okay and uh so where do you think short sales are, are going from here what are the, some of the trends you've seen to kind of get us up to now in terms of um if there are more short sales available or they're just easier to convert because of some of the systems and uh that lenders have put in place to make it easier on their side and where do you see things going over the let's say the next couple of years with uh, short sale opportunities? Um, <clears throat> I believe short sales in the volume that we're seeing them now should stay around for about two more years. Um, and, and that's based on the fact that by um, 2008, the market values of houses had climbed so high um, that people who bought, let's say from 2006 to 2008, are still upside down and to be honest they'll probably be upside down for another 10 years mm. because they, they overpaid by that much and you know and the, when you're paying off a mortgage at first you're most of your payment is interest and very right. little goes to principal so there's there's going to be short sales you know for forever and this bubble we went through in 2008 will probably be out there till you know 2018 19 um, but the volume will drop off but now here, I'll get on my soapbox and give you my prediction. Sure. And it's based kind of on personal experience and um, other things. I got two kids that are of college or out of college. And uh, my daughter has been out of school for a couple of years. And she came out of school with $30,000 of debt. Right. Uh, my brother and sister have kids the same age. And all of their kids are sitting on between fifty dollars and $20,000 of debt. So it's a, it's a lot of debt that young people are carrying, and, and you hear in the news. Yeah, I think it's like a trillion dollars, a trillion dollars yeah. in uh, so, college debt. Right. So when you, my my daughter, the you know, let's say she marries um, somebody that's similar to her, that's sitting on thirty thousand dollars of debt. You know, as a couple, that's sixty k of debt. They're never going to get a mortgage until they pay that debt down a little bit. Hmm. So I think we're going to have this generation of people that should be buying their first starter home now and over the next three or four years that aren't going to be buying houses and i think that's going to cause another problem in the housing market so i think that that lack of demand for starter homes is going to cause people that have starter homes that need to upgrade 
a difficulty in selling those things at a profit. And it's and right now I think Wall Street's propping it up by the hedge funds buying these properties, but I don't think that's going to last for others. So I believe we're going to see another dip in the housing market in the next couple of years, and it could bring short sales back to the front again. Okay. Okay. So maybe there's a short sale opportunity to uh, pay off college debt. What do you think about that? Yeah, <laughs> that that would be really uh, a good business. Uh, but that that would be a tough one because college debt is one of those things you it's really hard to get out of. Even if you file bankruptcy, it doesn't go away. Yeah. So getting and but maybe there's a way to, to for lenders to say, look, we'll we'll pay it off if you accept this amount to kind of negotiate a upfront uh, payoff. Yeah. Yeah, business. that that would work. Um, that's an idea, Mike. Yeah, I don't, know. Don't hey, tell anybody. Hey. <laughs> I won't tell any. I won't tell a soul. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's something to think about. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So, so you think? Um, and what do you think about just the short, the general shortage of inventory in the market right now? I mean, at this point, obviously, it's gotten tight pretty much everywhere across the country. I mean, record lows in terms of uh, days on market and inventory availability. That's just really is kind of pushing prices up all around. Yeah. Again, um, I attribute that personally to the amount of houses that are still upside down. I think there's a, a large portion of people out there that have upside down houses that can't sell, but they're not in a position where they have to sell. You know, they, right. they, they're holding down a job. They make good money. They don't they're, they're not in a position to where they they have to get rid of the house, but they're not because they can't. And they, maybe they want to. I think. Statistically, most houses, people only hold them seven years and then they, they upgrade. But I think there's a lot of people out there that can't. So it's, it's holding back the market that should be out there selling. And, you know, that's causing what's out there to go up in price. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a limited inventory. So it's, it, you know, it could be perceived as a uh, a false increase in prices just because of the limited inventory. You know, it's typical supply and demand. Right. Um, but again, I think if you throw in my prediction on top of that, where less buyers are going to be out there, and if Wall Street and, and the investing community um, isn't buying like they are now, could see a dip. Right. Right. So, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you? Uh, how you work with others. So talk about, so for folks that are walk, watching the show that might be interested in working with you, whether they're investors, agents, uh, we may even have some folks that are looking for a way to do a, a short sale on their own house to get out of it. Talk about kind of who, who the different um, folks you serve are that you work with and then how they, how they get a hold of you. Um, we serve pretty much anybody. Okay. And like I said earlier, um, if they're upside down in value and they have a financial difficulty in paying for the house, that qualifies them for a short sale. Um, to, to come to us, they can either come to us directly um, by contacting, contacting us through the website or calling our phone number, which you can find on our website. Um, the, the other way, which is more common, is, is that these folks are contacting investors like um, the folks that you deal with um, or real estate agents looking for um, a way to get out of the house. And if that's the case, what the investor can do is basically just bring it to us and say, you know, we've got, I got somebody that's upside down. Um, I'd like to buy the house. Um, can you help me by getting it sold short? And we, from there, we take over. We'll contact, all we ask is that you give the homeowner a heads up that they're gonna be contacted by OYAs. We'll contact them, we'll screen them, we'll do all the paperwork. We'll get the house um, set up from a, a sales sales point. Not we're not going to go in and touch the house. Right. Um, we'll get it set up for the sale. At the same time, we would be looking for an offer from the investor for what they're willing to pay for it. If that comes in first, um, what we do is we submit that offer to the bank. And now that's that's one difference between a short sale and let's say an REO or a foreclosure. In a, in a foreclosure. Um, the way the banks manage it is, is that the agent collects all the offers. Let's say they get five or ten offers. They submit them all to the bank, and the bank goes through them and determines which one they want. In a short sale, it doesn't work that way. It's basically first one in gets the first um, shot at the house. So offer comes in, we execute it with the seller, and we send it to the bank. And okay. if it's a 
offer that the bank is willing to accept, it's it's a done deal and the house is sold to that first person. But if the bank comes back and they do their due diligence and let's say it's just a super low ball offer, it's a hundred thousand dollar house and they put an offer in for forty thousand. Um, the bank may come back and say, eh, 40K ain't going to work, but I'll take 80. Um, we would go back to the investor and say, they, they want 80. Are you willing to pay 80? If the investor says, yeah, yeah, 80 will work, then it's their house. But if the investor says, eh, 80 ain't going to work, I, I won't do it. Basically, their offer is taken off the table, and then we put the a backup offer, which they come in we because we're on the market on MLS. Right. We, we go to them and say, we the bank wants 80. Anybody want to pay 80? Um, we take the highest offer. It goes to the bank and it's sold. And in that case, since it was brought in by the investor, we'll pay him a finder's fee for um, bringing it bringing it in as a short sale. So okay. either way, you know, they may get the house, um, which is a good, a much better deal for them. Right. Um, if not, then they they do get um, some cash out of it for bringing it in the door. So given the fact that investors are typically offering much lower prices than say a homeowner, you know, might or owner occupant might, what, what's your sense on what percentage of the time, uh, the investor that brings a short sale opportunity to you is actually able to buy the house? Um, I'm going to qualify that by putting two different buckets because the investors are bringing all kinds of houses in. If right. they're pretty houses, then almost always they're not going to get it. Right. Um, because the banks, like I said earlier, they do their due diligence. If it's a pretty house, it's in good shape. They know they can get good money out of that house and they're going to demand top dollar. Right. Um, so they won't discount it. But now if they bring in a house that's, uh, physically distressed, in other words, it's the homeowner is just ruined the house. You know, there's no flooring or the foundation is so bad that there's huge cracks in the walls and, um, you know, roof, plumbing, electrical problems, th those type of houses um, homeowners have a difficult time buying because you can't get them financed right. anymore. Um, if if the floor if it has no flooring, you're, you're not going to get an FHA loan. Right. And even conventional loans, you'd have to put a, down a pretty big um, down payment in order to get a conventional loan on a house that's physically distressed. Mm -hmm. So the banks, and that's another thing that's changed, is the banks understand that only an investor is going to buy these physically distressed homes, so they're willing to give investor prices on those. Yeah. Um, and so in those cases, when they're poor condition houses, um, I'd say about half the time we see the investor get the house. Wow, that's great. Um, that's great. But again, it, it has to be the physically distressed home, right. the, the pretty homes. And, and, and if I had to break it up, the vast majority of houses that investors bring in are pretty homes. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, uh, John, if people want to get a hold of you at OEAs, can you talk a little bit about real, qu real quickly how they'd get a hold of you, what, what website to go to, what number to call? Um, you can get to our website, which is OEAs.com, which is O-Y-E-Z-Z.com. Um, or they can call our office number, which is 972-342-0011. And uh, just ask for one of the sales folks and they'll talk to you all you want. Great, great. Well, we'll put that uh, information below the video as well so anybody watching can get a hold of you guys. So, John, thanks for sharing your information on the short sale industry and the story on how you uh, got to where you are. And it's it's interesting um, in doing these shows. I, I'm always, I always want to hear the angle of when an entrepreneur discovered that there's got to be a better way or there's an opportunity here that uh, needs to be exploited. And so it's interesting to hear your story on that. So thanks for joining yeah, thanks for having me. It was really fun talking to you. Okay, great, great. We'll take care and we'll see you around. Okay. All righty. Bye, 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 Mike. Are you a member of Flipner.com, the most robust real estate investing platform in existence, where you can find off-market wholesale deals and great vendors literally in your market? You can get access to advice from experts and learn about local clubs and events right in your backyard. If not, please visit Flipner.com and register for a free account. You can register in less than a minute. It's pretty much the coolest site that's ever existed in the real estate investing industry. So get on over to flipnerd.com.